And now, Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. Today, the business of our work is for the council to report on the work that has occurred since our last meeting across these areas. We will today also discuss the work yet ahead, the work we must still do. This has been Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. Welcome to the program today, and uh, let me be the first to tell you, I can confirm the rumors, I do have legs. It's true. Uh, And I will assure you that I have done now over 575 episodes of this stupid show, and every single one of them, I've sat behind that desk and always had my suit pants on. Not once was I wearing uh, jeans or sweatpants or shorts or just going bottomless. That never occurred just so you're fully aware. Today is our first kind of big uh, Senate preview. We've got the chalkboard out. We're going to go through, set the, I don't know, set the scene a little bit for you. Where are we in the Senate race and where are we going? Uh, obviously, as you know, uh, election coverage has been a big part of, uh, of the show and my entire history here at The Blaze. I'll be doing election coverage once again on election night to hopefully not completely depress you, maybe give you some good news uh, for once. We will see as we get closer. Uh, We've been doing this for a long time now, and we want to keep an eye on the Senate. It's incredibly crucial. We're talking Supreme Court justices on the line, blocking terrible legislation, all the things that can happen over the next couple of years. This is a big one. It's a very interesting race. So let's dive into it here. We'll go through this and we'll be updating this, especially as races change, but really regularly as we get closer and closer to the election. We don't have that much longer. Six, seven, eight weeks, something like that. So we will go through this a lot as we go uh, through uh, this. And as you might know, um, last time I stood in front of this board, I gave you an uh, an, uh, estimate as to what we thought was going to happen in the presidential election. Uh, The electoral vote count 306 to 232 was our prediction. That is exactly what happened. So obviously I'm going to nail this perfectly every single time I stand up here. Don't worry about it. That wasn't a one-time thing. It's going to happen every time. Let's go through the race here and set the scene. The main thing to start is the Senate is weird, right? It's not like the House where everything is up every two years. Uh, There is a sort of a a leaned playing field going on here, and it starts in favor of Democrats this year. That's an important thing to remember. When we go through how many solid Democrats, not even up for election, you start right there with 36 for the Democrats. And that is a, a playing field that Republicans are going to have to overcome because for Republicans, they start instead, not 36, but 29. That's sort of the opening foray here as we start race for control of the Senate. Now, look, I'd like to bring drama into every one of these races. I'd love to tell you that everyone's going to be really interesting and we're going to watch them all really. Ratings should go through the roof because every one of these races is going to be fascinating. The truth is a lot of them are not interesting at all. In fact, probably the majority of these races are not really interesting at all. But let's set them all up for you here. Uh, We start off. uh, These are races that are solid Democrat. These are likely not going to be very close as we get to election night. But let's give you the rundown here. Oregon. Uh, going to be a Democratic seat, almost definitely. Hawaii, not exactly a shocker here. Illinois, you may know that's kind of a blue state. They're probably going to do pretty well in Illinois. Maryland as well, a state that should not be all that close. Chuck Schumer, yes, he's still around and kicking and for some reason getting votes in New York. Um, To try to give you, if there's anything interesting, let me try to give you a couple here. Connecticut, Connecticut is, oh, of course I had to drop one. Connecticut is moderately, it's closer than it should be. And the reason why is because Blumenthal is really, really terrible. I mean, he's really annoying. Um, he is the sort of Democrat that even Democrats don't like all that much. But still, in a state like Connecticut, it's almost impossible for him to lose. Vermont is interesting only because, let's put it here. Vermont is interesting only because 
look, the Democrats are going to absolutely win Vermont. There's no there's no doubt about that. Uh, however, it was Bernie Sanders is the other senator in Vermont. As you know, he's technically an independent, but obviously a socialist and a Democrat. Um, his the guy who followed him in the state Senate or if, uh, as congressman is now trying to get the other seat. So the guy, like everyone was like, ah, who should we vote for for congressman? Bernie Sanders. Who's next? Uh, how about Welch? Let's try him. Now he's going to be the other senator in Vermont. Isn't that wonderful? Aren't you excited about it? And of course, uh, California as well. That's no, no big surprises there, as you might look at those and say, OK, absolutely. That's the way that's going to probably turn out. So likely Democrat, we have eight seats for the Democrats. Now let's go over to the Republican side. There's a bunch of likely Republican seats as well. And we start off with Alabama. Uh, Arkansas and Iowa, the first three here. Again, no big surprises here. Uh, you've got Idaho, continue to stay on the Republican side. Indiana, not going to be close. Kansas, Kansas, again, like everyone t was telling us, oh, well, because of the abortion thing, now Kansas are a bunch of Democrats. Eh, we'll see about that. I, I kind of doubt it. Kentucky, Rand Paul should cruise. Uh, Louisiana. That one is always a little weird because of their format. They do the thing where the, if no one wins 50% of the vote, they'll have a runoff. Always a slight chance for that to get out of control, but in case we see any new information, we're not going to change that one. North Dakota is there as well. Oklahoma has, we're going to double it up, double Oklahoma for you. There is a special election there too. It's the only state with two Senate elections in this cycle. You have Tim Scott in South Carolina who's going to have uh, no problem there and South Dakota as well. Now you see there's more. I don't know. I mean, just visually, you might be able to tell more states there. The number for Republicans here when it comes to safe is 13. Uh, so you're kind of you kind of see where we're going here. Uh, it tightens up pretty closely when you knock out these safe races. Now we go to the leaning category. Uh, this these aren't decided. The, there could be some interesting things that happen in these races, but they're leaning one side or another. We'll start. Uh, with Democrats in Colorado. This is a, a, a story of uh, the polls are oddly close, I could say, in Colorado. If you're a Democrat, you know, Colorado is a weird state. Their governor was one of the only uh, go Democratic governors who said, hey, you know, once you get vaccinated, we should stop with all these restrictions. He's kind of ahead of that. It's a little bit of a purple state still, though leans blue and likely will remain blue. But it's mildly competitive there. Washington is interesting as the, the Republicans have fielded a candidate they really like there. The polling is about you know, it's a low double digits right now. So there's a lead in Washington for Democrats. But Republicans seem to have a good candidate there, someone who might be able to be competitive. Some polls have showed that race in single digits. It's going to be a stretch, but it's possible in a wave type of election. This is the type of race that could turn the Republicans way if that's the way it goes. Uh, next up is New Hampshire. Now, New Hampshire, it has there has been some close polling in New Hampshire. The New Hampshire primary just happened. The ca candidate that won for the Republicans uh, it has polled worse than his opponent uh, in the general election. So, you know, this is one of those cases where they're trying to paint him as this election denier and all of this. Uh, Maggie Hassan is the senator there. These polls have been pretty close. A lot of people have this in the toss up category. I currently have it in the leaning Democratic category. It's one of those, again, in a wave election type of year, if Republicans are at the peak of what they can do in this election, they might win a state like New Hampshire. Right now, they're down in the polling. We'll see how that goes. And the last one is a one that's received quite a bit of attention on, on this program, Pennsylvania. Now, look, Pennsylvania was a 16-point race and a 13-point race in polls from a few weeks ago. This has tightened all the way down to about four, between three and five points over the past few polls. John Fetterman is a socialist in a hoodie. He is uh, a guy who can't speak. He has uh, really obviously had a, a terrible thing with a stroke. He, but like the stroke is a distraction from what a terrible, terrible candidate this guy is. He's not a Pennsylvania Democrat. This is the type of guy that would be at home in a Bernie Sanders seat, right? This is a guy who is literally a Sanders guy. He Every liberal policy, if you want to take AOC and make him 14 foot tall and make him look like Herman Munster and put a hoodie over him, that's John Fetterman. And he's going up against Dr. Oz. Now, Oz was not the strongest candidate, I don't think, in the primary, but he's there. He's closed the race quite a bit. And while it has closed a significant amount, it's still a lean Democrat at this point. If we can get a debate 
that might change. And this is one of the reasons why, of course, John Fetterman is avoiding debate seemingly at all costs. Eventually, he'll probably have to do one. He said he will do one debate with Dr. Oz. And I think at that point, Dr. Oz should be pretty good at communicating things. I, you know, again, he's sort of an unknown. Donald Trump really liked him. He endorsed him. We hope he was right on that. And he does have a chance to win that race. These, there's a couple races, particularly in New Hampshire and Pennsylvania, that Republicans could pull off if the right circumstances present themselves. Now let's go over to the Repo- Oh, by the way, that's uh, four. There's four races in the lean Democratic category. Now let's go over to the lean Republican category. And, uh, and I'll give you a couple. These aren't... These aren't te- I wouldn't say these are technically leaners, but I wanted to signal them out just for because they're very strange races. Uh, number one is Alaska. Now, Alaska is a red state, should remain a red state. However, they have a very odd system, as you may know, with ranked choice voting. There's some things I like about ranked, ranked choice voting, but it makes these elections a lot more difficult to understand. There hasn't been a lot of examples of anybody using it. Um, and Alaska has a situation here where the top two competitors were basically the Trump-supported candidate going up against Lisa Murkowski, another Republican. So the chances of it becoming a Republican seat are near 100 percent. The Democrats in Alaska are voting for Murkowski and trying to make her the sort of moderate Republican choice. As you, of course, know, she voted for impeachment. She voted. uh, She's been a pro-choice vote throughout her tenure in the Senate. She's a legacy candidate. Her her daddy was senator before her. She won a write-in campaign years ago against a Tea Party candidate. It seems like she's never going away. There's a good chance here that she might go away. So I put this in the leaners because either way it falls, it's going to fall to the Republicans. It will still remain a Republican seat, but it really is. We're unsure at this point who's going to win that seat. I think 538 has the Trump supported challenger as the favorite right now. I, I don't know. After seeing her win that that write in candidate uh, write in race uh, years ago, it's hard for me to believe Lisa Murkowski will ever not be senator uh, in in Alaska. But we will see as that one gets closer. Well, another weird one to put in here, and again, I don't think this is a pure leaner race, but I'm putting it here is Utah. Now, Utah. Look, Mike Lee is going to win Utah. I think that's the truth. The reason why I put that this one in the leaning category and not in the solid is because it's one of the more interesting races. They're trying, the the Democrats are trying an experiment here. And this is one of the first times they've tried it, which is basically to take a bright red state and take a, you know, what I think is, in my opinion, the best senator in the Senate, Mike Lee, and try to take him out in a bright red state by using not a Democrat, but an independent. They're running Evan McMullen as the challenger in this state. And McMullen is like, look, he's changed on all of his positions from when he ran for president in 2016. He's sort of now trying to claim that he's a Republican, but uh, all of his conservative principles seemingly have gone out the window. Not the case with Mike Lee, who's been really, really consistent and just done a great job. Uh, if you care about the Constitution, I think Mike Lee is, is the biggest stalwart for it. And so uh, I don't think he's going to have a problem in Utah winning this race. But it is interesting. And I will say, if you're looking at this one and you're not sure what to do here, this is a model that Democrats will use constantly if it works here. If they can even get this race close in Utah, they will be running these sort of hidden uh, Democrats running as independents all over the country. So it's a really important one to keep an eye on. Uh, Also, Missouri, we're going to put in this category. Now, Missouri, um, this was a, a big primary that we covered quite a bit. Uh, with a, uh, a candidate, Greitens, who was sort of flawed and had a lot of problems and what looked like he was winning for a while, uh, wound up going to Eric Schmidt, who's a very solid candidate. I think this one now has moved into more solid, ca- uh, uh, more solid category for Republicans, a, a likely hold for Republicans there. Then we have uh, Florida. This one's interesting. I- Frankly, Florida right now, I think one of the things that's interesting about Florida is we all look at Ron DeSantis, who is uh, quite popular and will likely win relatively easily. My expectation is mid to high single digits. Uh, Not going to be a barn burner, but not going to be a complete blowout either. One of the things people forget about Ron DeSantis is he was very popular before COVID kind of kicked in. People kind of look at him nationally and say he took really good stances against COVID and he's taken stances in these sort of culture war issues and it's made him more popular. In actuality, he was more popular before those stances, but he's been much more popular and stood out within his base, which has made him a 2024 leader. As far as the uh, the the generally um, uh, purple state of Florida, though, 
he's turned off some of those moderate voters with some of these stances. Now, he's still going to win the race, I think. And I think because of that as well, he's going to pull Marco Rubio uh, across the finish line as well. Rubio, uh, you know, doesn't make a lot of mistakes. He's not particularly a uh, he doesn't drive a ton of passion these days uh, from the base, but he should have no problem holding on here. The polling is closer than I would think it would be. Uh, Val Demings is the opponent, was uh, talked about as a potential VP in Florida, uh, has uh, some Democratic base energy behind her, probably enough to keep it close. I don't think it's going to be enough to beat Marco Rubio, but right now we have that one leaning toward Republican. And the other one is Ohio. We talked to J.D. Vance earlier today on the radio show. If you missed that uh, interview, it's worth checking out. J.D. Vance, it's a red state. Uh, he was kind of brought in. Uh, Peter Thiel uh, support behind him. Uh, Donald Trump supported him. He's the media, again, tried to make him into this election denying crazy person. Doesn't seem like who he actually is. They used to love the guy when he's making hillbilly elegy. Uh, everyone loved the guy. He was the, the hero of Hollywood. That's sort of changed now, but he has uh, come back. He, at the beginning, kind of was behind, has been able to kind of close that race up and now leads slightly. Uh, so we have five over here in the lean Republican category, which uh, will leave us with uh, our, our, our leaners here. So what we have, um, excuse me, the toss-up category. The toss-up category, we've got five races here. I'm going to go through them here real quickly. This is Blake Masters in Arizona, a race that was eight to ten points just a few weeks ago, has narrowed to more like four or five. Uh, it is still a lead for the Democrat, but uh, this one is a, a toss-up here. Nevada, uh, Laxalt and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Cortez Mastro. I never get that name right. But anyway, she's the incumbent Democrat in Nevada. These, these polls are razor thin right now, basically at a tie. Wisconsin, Ron Johnson, an incumbent trying to hold on. Again, is another one where Republicans have improved. Despite the narrative of all this Democratic momentum, Republicans have improved their polling. And now uh, Ron Johnson has a slight re lead. We have that in the toss up. Bud in uh, North Carolina has a slight lead in polling right now for Republicans. Uh, that one looking good for Republicans, but still an open seat, no incumbent. So a little bit of a question in a very purple state, as well as Georgia and Herschel Walker, who, again, was behind by high single digits for a while. Now some polls show him slightly ahead. Some polls show him slightly behind. That gives us five toss-up races as well. So where does this make us stand? Where, where's the grand picture here? Well, if you're a mathematician, you may have already figured this out. But let me put these up for you. This gives the Democrats 48 senators if they were to... Ah, these darn things keep dropping. If they were able to, uh, to win all of their safe races and their leaner races, Democrats would have 48 seats. Republicans would have 47 if they were able to do the same. And if you kind of look at the picture here, you get the general sense of where we stand. This is really freaking close. 48-47 with five toss-up races. What does that mean? It means Republicans have to win four of five of these toss-up races. Of course, that also includes winning their leaners, not blowing one of these races over on the, on the far right side of this board. But uh, here, you got five races, Arizona, Nevada, Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Georgia. Republicans need to win four of five to get that 51st vote. Of course, they can't just get to 50 like they are now because then Kamala Harris will, I mean, you saw her speaking at the beginning of the show during veepthoughts.com. You know what she can do. She's she can make all these votes go the wrong way. So it's really important that you win four out of five here, get to 51 votes, and at least you can block the worst stuff. You may still lose a Mitt Romney or a Susan Collins and not be able to block everything, but you should be able to at least block the worst stuff in the Senate, the worst candidates for the Supreme Court uh, if they happen to come up. So that's where we are right now. 48 for the Democrats, 47 for the Republicans, five toss-ups. Republicans need to win four of five. We will continue to give you the updates and give you uh, updates on where, how polling changes, how these races change as we go forward. So make sure to check us out on all the social media. We'll give you all the information that you need as we get closer and closer to election 2022.
So the last time we went through a recession, there were stocks that literally went to zero. I mean, remember Lehman Brothers, of course, Washington Mutual, Chrysler, uh, multiple blue chip stocks went to little or no value almost overnight. Could that happen again? Uh, if it did, are your savings protected? Why not own something that has never been valued at zero? That's gold. Historically, your best hedge against inflation, gold is is a big pushback against the inflation that we've seen. It's basically like a hockey stick at this point, uh, despite what the Biden administration keeps telling you. Oh, no, it's pretty much flat. It's just up an inch. The savviest Americans diversify their savings to protect them from downturns in the market. Uh, global instability, uh, falling dollar, all these things. Do you do that? Birch Gold Group can help you hold gold and silver in a tax-sheltered retirement account. If you have a 401k or IRA that's underperforming, text the word STU to 989898. You can convert that into an IRA in precious metals right this moment. Text STU to 989898 and Birch Gold will send you a free info kit on diversifying into gold tax-free. Hedge against inflation. Protect your hard-earned money. Make some moves to protect yourself. Get, you, get your free info kit, check it out, do your own homework, and text STU to 989898. It's STU to 989898. Check it out now. It's Birch Gold. Let's bring in Dan Andros. He's the managing editor for CBN and Faithwire.com, host of CBN's podcast, Quick Start. Be sure to subscribe to that wherever you may be. Dan, how's it going? Great. Thanks for coming on the program today. I want to, uh, st- well, let me start here before we get into the actual news. Uh, The NFL, of course, is in full swing. And I'm fascinated by by your life as an NFL fan. We've known each other for a very long time. You were a Washington Redskins fan for the entire time I've known you until... The NFL deleted the Washington Redskins out of existence. Right. I, I still, let's just clarify here, Stu. I still am a Washington Redskins fan. They just don't <laughs> exist anymore. They don't no. exist anymore. Okay. Yeah. So then you switch to the Indianapolis Colts last year because you like Carson Wentz, which is odd because, of course, he was the Eagles quarterback, the arch rival right. of uh, one of the arch rivals of the Washington Redskins when they existed. Then yeah, the- I'm, I'm a big Carson Wentz fan, mm-hmm. and so I was like, look, I need another team here. How about just something from the heartland? I'll, my daughter likes horses. But we'll go with the Colts. <laughs> go with the Colts. They, they seem to be a safe, uh, you know, a lock, like to at least be a good team every year. Well, I apologize to Colts <laughs> fans across the country because my mere presence, it's like Luke Skywalker endangering the mission because Darth Vader can sense his presence. I've come into the Colts <laughs> sphere and I've endangered the mission. I've ruined it. I apologize. Yeah, it's it's pretty fascinating. Now that now Carson Wentz, he goes there. They, he has a he has actually a pretty good year up until the last week or two. Yeah, bad end. Totally falls apart. They miss the playoffs. They send him out of town, which very much seems like the owner of the Colts Angry at Wentz for not getting vaccinated. Angry at him for uh, for God knows what. They send him out of town. They bring in Matt Ryan, and now they seem like they're worse. I, I, and it, this is this guy. Well, that's, that's part of the thing. Like the the Wentz thing is interesting to me because it's sort of like the Tebow stuff all over again, almost. And I don't know that it's because of his faith, but he. Carson Wentz has become this media narrative. Anytime he makes a mistake, it's like this. Oh, 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 Carson Wentz being Carson Wentz. When you look at the guy's numbers, they're, I mean, he's, look, he's not the greatest quarterback in the world, but he's certainly above average. And every quarterback makes boneheaded interceptions and gets fumbled. They get sacked from behind. But for some reason, Carson Wentz is the butt of the jokes. And so it just drives me insane. And, uh, and then also the character smears, everyone's saying like, oh, he's a, you know, he, he was bad in the clubhouse. He's only so, it was all, all based on rumors. None of that's very, no one has yet that I know of spoken on record right. saying something negative about his character. And so it's all very frustrating. So, yes, you can imagine how my life turned it got twisted then when he gets shipped back to Washington. <laughs> now I'm really conflicted. What do I do? And this is bizarre because now they're not even the Washington football team. They're the Washington no. Commanders, which is a whole yeah. other crazy thing. And now Wentz is there on your uh, on a on the derivative of your old favorite team, and there he's playing much better than Matt Ryan is on the Colts, which is I, fascinating. It is. It's all very. It's yeah. It's. 
I have mixed emotions here, Stu. <laughs> I, again, I don't know what to do with it. I mean, I'm definitely always rooting for Carson Wentz. And I will say, your Eagles, Stu, with Jalen Hurts. Mm. I just heard that he's also a Christian. And so I'm very I'm very <laughs> biased towards the Christian players. I just, I'm just going to come out and admit it. I will say, um, I, I like that. And now I, he's supposedly, got, and I'm like, uh-oh, don't make me like the Eagles again. Mm. Uh, this is where eventually we'll 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 suck you in to uh, to, the, to to be an Eagles fan. Uh, it's interesting too with you know uh, Jalen Hurts and we we're not going to spend this entire thing talking actual sports here. Right. But what I think is interesting about Hurts and I you know he, he I really like Hurts a lot as a person and I'm, I'm not I have not been 100 percent convinced he's going to be the answer at quarterback. I don't know. But what I, I've known from the beginning with him is he not only has what seems to be a kind of a Christian mindset, but also. Like, uh, like a military mindset, like a guy yeah. that is just there to get the job done. Nothing rattles him. He gets better every single year. He works incredibly hard. Everything about the guy, you just have to love. Yeah. And Philadelphia just doesn't deserve him with all the <laughs> nonsense that goes on on their airwaves. Not you, but the right. rest of Philadelphia. I like the disclaimer. Thank you. But we're all part of the same group. Um, uh, let me move off a little bit, kind of related here, an issue of sports, which I found to be fascinating. There's an article in The Atlantic. Uh, separating sports by sex doesn't make sense. So we've had this thing where it was always, you know, boys and girls sports separate. Then it became this thing where we're going to take individual uh, pretty talented guys and put them just randomly into women's sports, call them women, and then they're going to dominate the sport. And we were all supposed to accept that. Now we've moved on to apparently a third thing, which is just every, I guess, men and women just play sports together and we don't separate them. A couple of excerpts from this, Dan. I want to get your reaction. They say, though sex differences in sports show advantages for men, researchers today still don't know how much of this to attribute to biological difference versus the lack of support provided to women athletes to reach their highest potential. Um, we have this belief that boys are inherently stronger than girls. But in reality, the relationship between sex and athletic capability is never so cut and dried. I mean, look. I feel like it is kind of cut and dried. I think they've been watching, whoever wrote that has probably been watching too many Marvel movies where all the women just dominate everything and yeah. every superhero <laughs> now is a woman that just beats up all the, the hapless men walking around. Anyone with eyeballs can see that by and large, in general, you, you take the top, you know, 1% of athletic men against the top 1% of athletic women. And it's just not even close. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just reality. I don't know how else you can say it. It's, it's not close. There's the occasional, um, you know, person who can, you know, woman who can actually rise above and maybe compete a little bit with the men, but you'd be seeing more of that if it was actually possible. And so it makes me wonder what is the agenda of somebody pushing these sorts of ideas are you trying to delete women from society or from things like sports? It, it seems like this is, and I and I know that there are some feminist activists who are starting to wake up to this. They're saying, hey, wait a minute. When you just allow men to just say they're women and make, treat womanhood like it's some sort of, you know, as Matt Walsh says, a costume that you can just put on, it's, you're reducing womanhood to, to nothingness. It, it just doesn't exist. And so they're, they're, these two ideas are like they're supposedly supporting women, but they're diametrically opposed to one another. You're erasing women. You, you push policies like this, getting rid of women's sports. You're just not going to have women in sports. Right, I mean, like, it's plain well, and simple. Under this construct of society, uh, we don't know who Serena Williams is. We don't know who Venus Williams is. We don't know who Martina Navratilova is. We don't know who many of the top female athletes of all time are. We don't, we don't yeah. know who any of these people are because they would go to compete and be dominated at some point in their lives by male athletes. And that's not, that's not a knock. No, like, it's We just have true. biological differences, and that's something we should acknowledge. It's just true. And Stu, you'll know this story. If you haven't done it on your show, I would encourage anybody to Google this. But you mentioned Venus and Serena. There, I think earlier on in their careers when they were getting all this hype, there was a guy that was ranked, I don't know if he was out of the tour or if he was just ranked like, you know, 300th or something, yeah. like a no name on the male tennis tour. And he, they were at the same tournament and he was like, yeah, let, yeah, they, they, they agreed to just play each other in a little match for fun. 
And, you know, he talked about prepping for it with cigarettes and beer. <laughs> and he just proceeds to wipe them off, you know, on the off the court. Yeah. Like just it's not even a competition. I mean, this is just a scrub dude beating the best women's tennis players of all time. I think it was a 6-1, 6-0 type of situation. It was yeah. a real domination. We there's another story here. It actually happened in Texas where the US women's Olympic soccer team played <laughs> yeah. a bunch of like thir- the best 13-year-old yeah. team of boys in the country. And got dominated by 13 and 14 year olds. I mean, look, I, you know, I I feel like we were at we're at a weird time in society, Dan, where yeah. we seem to have to do segments about stuff that everybody already knows. Everyone knows what we're saying is true. We're trying to explain it to people, and everyone's there and going, "Yeah, we, of course we know this." And I think the overwhelming majority of people actually do know these things. They know that they're true. But the, the media narratives are driven by, I don't know, the 10% of people who don't know they're true or want to change our minds about the truth. Well, you look at radical, um, sorry, I was getting feedback there. Hmm. You, you look at radical left activists, you know, Marxists, you know, Black Lives Matter. What was their mission statement? It was to, to dissolve the nuclear family or to, you know, fight against yeah. the nuclear family, however they worded it. And that is just something that the radical left pushes. They want to erase all of these things that they call, you know, the societal constructs. And so what we're having to do now, and we've not ever had to do this before, is make coherent arguments about basic truths, things that are self-evident. We've always known them as self-evident, i.e. men can't get pregnant. Now, now that should be even is is the most obvious example. But you're seeing other examples, like when you're seeing these trans activists now in schools being more outspoken. When we were going to school, Stu, I mean, we went to the same school. I don't remember hardly any of the teachers' first names. I, I mean, that's true. I don't know if I could. T- I don't think I could probably tell you half of them. Um, and now they're talking about their sexuality. There's the viral, the one teacher putting the prosthetic breasts on that were huge. And and I saw somebody, um, you know, a professor who's often critical of of woke themes and, and that, that sort of stuff. He was saying, look, how do you make a, you know, it's harder than it sounds to make a um, solid argument against why this person shouldn't be teaching. And I think he's right in a way. Like, yeah, we can make all the arguments that society used to agree on like, yeah, well, it's wrong to play out your sexual fetishes in front of kids in school. Well, what happens now when you have a section of society that's saying that's not wrong, that it's okay for them to express themselves? Mm. You have to go to where to a foundational argument now. And I think we're in new territory because we haven't had to do that before. We haven't had to say, here's why it's wrong. And as a Christian, I think we have to point to the Bible. I think we have to point to God. They're not going to like that. But otherwise, you're just arguing and you're just trying to make a case and it and it comes down to personal preference and how many people can you convince. Now, you might be able to win that argument because it should be obvious. But uh, but I think there's a deeper problem here where we need to connect basic truths to our creator because that's that is where basic truths come from. And if you try to explain it through other authorities, it's going to fall short. Uh, ultimately, and then it becomes a popularity contest. So. Yeah, you know, obviously the, the foundations of this country are rooted in Judeo-Christian values. And, and one of the things I think, if you look at our founding documents, one of the most, uh, I don't know, misunderstood or, or brushed over phrases is we hold these truths to be self-evident. It's so yeah. obvious. We're, it's so obvious that we all agree on this. Everybody here agrees on these ba- very basic principles. We can disagree outside of that. But this is all there, and we all know it's true. And we've now come to a place where at least half the country does not agree that these truths are self-evident anymore. And if we don't come up with a way to actually give a a moral argument to to essentially reprove them, you know, it's like you got to show your work again. We're back in that time, back in (laughs) math class. you got to show your work because now – this, these attacks on our foundations have had real gains, unfortunately, by people who want to change the foundation of the country, to change the structure of the country, to change, uh, you know, uh, these, these values that the country was founded on. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. And you think about kids and they're going through a lot of them public school and then into universities where what are they getting? They're getting more and more indoctrination. So not only are we having to go back and show our work, 
we're having to undo a lot of the quote unquote work that's been done to these younger generations that are now entering mm. the workforce and they're confused. They're so confused. I mean, things like um, sex work now. I mean, you know, I think we've talked about it before, but it, there used to be the shame element of, you know, if you wanted to, you know, engage in that activity. Now it's like you have this empowerment idea, like somehow it's empowering for females to reduce themselves to their physical bodies and what, you know, sexually they can offer and essentially making themselves a piece of meat. They, there's this trend in society now where you just put on uh, warm, soft music to it or or whatever and a, and a sappy video and now it becomes a thing that's acceptable. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's like, oh, look at these sex workers just struggling to get by and it's their workers too and they have dignity too and you put the sappy music behind it and it's like now everyone's for sex work it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. you know it's true i mean i you know or it's just you know it's it's to that shout shout your abortion shout your sex work type of stuff i saw a, a headline just uh, today and it was like a you know, I don't think I think it was from a relatively mainstream source. And it said basically like, hey, uh, the queen of OnlyFans is 19 years old and she's living like a rock star. It's like, are we supposed to be excited that a, a poor teenager who can't even go to a bar and get a drink has sold herself so frequently online that she is, you know, very, very wealthy? This is something our society is supposed to celebrate and get excited over. I'm sorry. I'm not going to get on that bandwagon. I'm just not going to. No. Do it. No, 100%. And and it's, again, there's this fracture here, and I think that's what it's coming down to. You're either going to go in the direction of Judeo-Christian values, as you said, nuclear family, um, you know, individual liberty, or you're going to go down this other road here, This and and that's really the fight. That's where it's at. I mean, you're seeing it now with the with the transgender hospitals, and I mean, the, the surgery stuff, I mean, just people mutilating their bodies or their children's bodies. And then, I mean, to me, that is the most in your face example of it. And people are accepting this. This isn't just radicals doing this. Parents are sending it because they think, oh, I'm culturing my kid. This is this is great. This is being inclusive. Yeah. And if you don't have I mean, the we got basis. a real problem here. And, you know, it's again, like you said, it's time to show the work and it's time to make to think past, you can't just give the obvious argument anymore. You can't just say, well, duh, you shouldn't be sexualizing yourself in front of kids. Uh, because people aren't, they, apparently they need more than that. Yeah. It's sad, but it's true. And if you don't have the foundations uh, to make those arguments, uh, then you're not going to be able to do that. And that's another reason for all of us to be much more well-versed in understanding of, of these concepts. Dan Andros, managing editor of CBN, um, faithwire.com, host of CBN's Quick Start, a podcast you should definitely be subscribed to. Get it every morning. Thanks, Dan, for coming on the program. All right. Thanks for having me, Stu. So are you in the real estate market? Have you seen the changes in the market recently? We are seeing rates go up. We're seeing the market get shaky in certain cities. Is this the beginning of some big change? Is this just a bump in the road? It's hard to know. Of course, trying to time the market is always a mistake, but you need someone, if you're going to try to buy or sell a home, you need to know someone who really understands what's going on out there, someone who's seeing it every single day, who knows the very specifics of your area, where the best places in town are to be, uh, you know, where the best school districts are, all that stuff. Uh, not to mention just a, the person who knows the process well enough to go through a buy or a sell in a way that maximizes your profits and gives you the best experience. Realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go to find that person. This was started by Glenn Beck many years ago to make sure you can find the best agent no matter where you are in the country. You go there, give them some basic info, they'll contact you and make the introduction to the per preferred agent in your area. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. Check it out now, realestateagentsitrust.com. What's, what's today, the 23rd, is it? Yeah, 23rd. Hmm. One more day. Tomorrow is the uh, three-month anniversary. Wow, already three months since uh, 6-24-22. That's the day, of course, Roe versus Wade was overturned. And now we're told um, that is going to be the thing that uh, destroys Republicans' election hopes. That may be the case. First of all, I'd trade, make that trade in a second. No offense to the Republicans. I'm sure they'd do a great job when they got in office. Uh, but, of course... I don't even really believe that. We'll be getting into, uh, obviously, even more of the election stuff uh, as we go on the next few weeks. But uh, just want to tell you, you can get your uh, commemorative stuff, 62422, the hats, 
the stickers, the mugs, the t-shirts, all the stuff at stewdoesmerch.com. Stewdoesmerch.com. The code is Stu10 to save 10% right now. 624-22. Available now at stewdoesmerch.com. The code is Stu10. Yeah, this little mug, 62422, a little problem for the left. They did not like that particular day. Not going to be a day, not going to be a shirt they're going to wear. Why? Well, they have a Supreme Court that actually seems to care about the Constitution right now. And the left despises that fact. When it comes to liberals in Congress, they're not going to accept term limits on themselves. And yet they're fighting tooth and nail to impose term limits on the Supreme Court. Now, why are they doing that? Well, they're doing that because who would it hit? People like, I don't know, Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas. Shockingly, they they were going to pack the court at first. That didn't work. Now they're going to try to get term limits on the court. Now, look, I am 100% in favor of term limits for Congress people, but that's not how the Supreme Court works. Um, And honestly, uh, it should be the way that the Congress works, but the Supreme Court is a totally different institution. Uh, It's been this way for quite a long time, and Democrats are trying to just get their way. Now, if, the, if RBG was still in, in the Supreme Court, they wouldn't be fighting for this. They'd go back to the packing of the court. But they're fighting for this now because they want to take out Alito and Thomas. It's true. First Liberty Institute is fighting back against this. They've been fighting against this stuff for a long time. You can help their efforts at SupremeCoup.com. SupremeCoup.com. It's C-O-U-P. SupremeCoup.com. Don't let them have a coup of the Supreme Court. It's SupremeCoup. The election's coming up. Some important votes will be cast, and I hope you are going to get to the polls. I, unfortunately, do not live in the state of Utah, because if I was there, there would be one vote I would definitely be casting. And, you know, you might say, oh, it's probably Mike Lee, right? Because Mike Lee, you keep blabbing on about this guy, and he likes the Constitution, and he's one of the best. I I think he's the best senator that we have. So maybe you'd vote for Mike Lee. And I'm sorry, Mike, I'd love to. But if I only had one vote to cast, I would be casting it in the race for District 12 uh, in the Utah State Senate seat there. Why would I be doing that? Because I am heavily influenced by advertising, including every time Taco Bell releases a new product, I'm there like the first day. So when I saw this ad, I knew where my one vote had to be cast. District 12, listen up right here. Mm-hmm. There's a new name on the ballot for the Senate this year. Mm. My name is Linda Paulson, Republican and awesome. Love God <laughs> and great. family and the Constitution. I tried really to get there. another conservative to run. Nobody could do it, so I'm getting it done. I'm pro-religious freedom, <laughs> pro-life, pro-police. The right to bear arms and the right to free speech. Mm-hmm. I want less government mm-hmm. control and so regulation. Mm-hmm. Want to stop and expose all political corruption. Where is integrity? Morality, accountability, government programs should lead to self-sufficiency and support traditional family as the fundamental unit of society. (laughs) But in schools, they're pushing for new beliefs. And just to clarify, as a female adult, I know what a woman is. Now, the editing may be not exactly perfect, but we love Linda Paulson. We want her to win just for her to make more ads. I I don't even care. I don't. She said what her policies are. She seems wonderful and delightful but I want more advertising from Linda. That's really all I want in the 2022 election. As we all know, the internet is largely trash. Uh, Almost nothing of value there, but there are some important questions and very important answers and some incredibly important websites that you need to know about. And one important question came in about one of those important websites. Here it is. The question is, has Joe Biden cured cancer? Hmm, what an incredible question. I wish there was a site that could answer that. And thankfully there is. HasJoeBidenCuredCancer.com. Yes, go to HasJoeBidenCuredCancer.com right now. HasJoeBidenCuredCancer.com. You will know no matter when you watch this broadcast or listen to it, if Joe Biden has cured cancer. By the way, as of right now, the answer is no. I mean, he promised to do it, but... The answer is, of course, no. Has Joe Biden cured cancer.com?